Discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. New Year's is the time for resolutions, new relationships, new developments, and all sorts of new beginnings. It's the time to mix it up when entertaining and celebrating with friends, family, and business associates. Try something new when planning a main course with festive dishes filled with lots of protein to help strengthen our immune system and protect us from winter viruses. Here to help inspire your inner chef, and your commitment to eating better this year is one of America's award-winning chefs, Chef Richard Chamberlain. Good morning, Chef. Good morning. I cooked up turkey for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Any suggestions just shake it up during the new year? Well, we, we love beef at my house for the New Year's, and uh, that's usually how we start off with uh, beef recipes. And, you know, one great thing about this year is uh, beef prices are really down, so great time for uh, consumers to take advantage of that and get some good values on beef. So how does beef play an important role in a balanced diet? Well, you know, beef is important uh, to keep us healthy, like you mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, what I, what I encourage uh, consumers to do is when you're shopping, uh, if you're looking for the leanest cuts, uh, look for loin or round in the name at the grocery store, and those will be the very leanest cuts for you. So leaner cuts are more nutritious? Well, you know, all cuts are nutritious. So whatever you're buying as it relates to beef, you're going to have uh, great vitamins and minerals uh, to keep you healthy uh, through these winter months. But if you're looking for just the very leanest, then look for uh, loin or round. Chef, can you share some simple and elegant dishes that will awe our guests when entertaining? I would love to. I have uh, three recipes today and uh, I've enjoyed uh, partnering with the Beef Checkoff to present these. Uh, first up, a beautiful appetizer. This is uh, beef pot stickers. There was shiitake mushrooms and an orange ponzu sauce. These are really simple to make. They're fun to make. Uh, actually, uh, we like to get the kids in the kitchen with us and make these together. So it's a great little family event. Again, uh, steam them up, serve with an orange ginger sauce. Really, really beautiful for the New Year's, for the Super Bowl, all kinds of great family occasions. What tips can you offer to help us cook family beef meals more often. Who doesn't love a beautiful rib roast? This one is glazed on the outside with maple syrup and fresh thyme. And that's what gives it really the beautiful color. It gets beautiful and brown anyway, but this really just kind of highlights it. And uh, you see that beautiful glaze it, it puts on there. And um, oh, what a, what a crowd pleaser. My wife likes to cook, cook this for the New Year's. She uses a meat thermometer uh, and cooks it at 350, up to about 135 degrees for a perfect medium rare every time. So really, really easy, but this, uh, this meat thermometer is really required to make it perfect. Uh, take it to 135 degrees. And then lastly, this uh, stuffing dish is great for New Year's. Uh, it has uh, uh, lean beef, it has green apples, cranberry, uh, beef stock that gives it beautiful moisture, sage that just fills the kitchen uh, with uh, that beautiful aroma. Uh, great to use uh, you know, for New Year's or the Super Bowl. So these are three, uh, three great recipes you can't go wrong with. So chef, what kind of side dishes would you pair it up with? For example, we have a roasted acorn squash uh, to go with the beef. Um, again, you can use the same glaze, which is maple and thyme and garlic over that roasted acorn squash. And, you know, again, cook it in the same pan, it's simple. Sounds yummy. So then it will absorb all the meat flavors. It absolutely does, and it just turns out beautiful. Again, that glaze on the outside is gorgeous. And hey, if you're looking for other recipes for the New Year's, go to uh, beefitswhatsfordinner.com. There's uh, recipes, chef tips for cooking beef, like using the meat thermometer. Or uh, also short videos. You know, I, sometimes videos uh, bug me because they're so long, but these are one minute videos uh, that really lay out exactly how to cook these recipes and make it very simple. Great, we can all use some quick how-to tips. Exactly. Anything else you would like to share? Well, uh, have a happy new year and enjoy uh, cooking these beautiful beef dishes.
Thank you, Chef Chamberlain, for sharing some of your award-winning tips on cooking up fabulous dinners to dazzle the table all year long. Happy New Year to you. Thank you, you too. This new year, we're all preparing for new public policies to be introduced in the U.S. by our new president. Immigration is big on many people's minds. For more than 70 years, the American Immigration Lawyers Association has advocated for fair and reasonable immigration laws. So how will the new administration wipe out the fear many illegals feel and the legitimate concern of Americans who fear for the safety of our nation? Joining us this morning is Bill Stock, president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, to discuss how our new president's plans will affect immigration, the economy, and America's security. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Rose. Bill, you practice immigration law for over two decades. Your message to immigrants is stay calm, seek counsel, and try to better understand their constitutional rights. But that may be a challenge, right? I, you know, I think it certainly is going to be a challenge, uh, and, and our communities need to step forward and show that uh, America still values immigrants, uh, still values the contributions that they make to the United States, and that there are still legal routes to come to the United States uh, and maintain their status. All right, tell us, what are the chances of mass deportation of illegal immigrants in the U.S.? You know, the number of immigration officers is not going to change in the really short term. But the priority that they give to certain kinds of immigration cases may certainly change. Uh, up until now, President Obama has told those agencies to really focus on the most serious criminals, uh, on folks who violated removal orders or who've come back to the United States after removal. The long and difficult police work to locate those people uh, and to remove them uh, from the U.S. Uh, if we change that priority, if we prioritize numbers, uh, getting as many people out as possible, the agencies are going to be less uh, careful or care, uh, about who they pull into that dragnet. And so I think more people who have family in the United States, who've been here for a long time, um, are going to find themselves in removal proceedings. There is a concern if DACA, an American immigration policy known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, could possibly halt its initiative. And these people could be deported. Is that realistic? I think that uh, the president-elect uh, has certainly talked about uh, wanting to change the uh, uh, priorities, change the executive orders that were in the immigration space. Look, all President Obama did was he said that young people brought to the United States, often uh, at such a young age that they had no part in the decision, uh, who've been educated, we've invested in their education for 12 years or more, uh, that these people should be the lowest priority for deportation uh, amongst uh, those that, that we could possibly remove. And given that we've recognized that they're a low priority, that they should have uh, work authorization to be able to support themselves. So yeah, those folks have the most uh, to worry about in terms of that program is likely to end. Uh, and uh, very quickly, they will not be able to uh, obtain that work authorization. Uh, and we'll need to look for uh, if they have any option to remain in the United States legally. As an immigration expert, do you believe that some illegals will be yanked out of their communities and removed from the U.S.? Well, it will happen in some cases. I think that's, uh, that's really, uh, we've seen this uh, before. We saw it uh, in the years after 9-11. Uh, uh, we saw it in the early years of uh, George W. Bush's administration that you know, the agencies were uh, told that they needed to uh, show a significant result. They needed to have uh, numbers of people uh, that they removed. And so very harsh uh, tactics were put in place, often tactics that uh, really didn't reflect our American values of due process. Uh, you know, uh, in Postville, Iowa, for example, a very large raid where uh, individuals were pulled into trailers. They brought federal judges along with them and were told, uh, you can plead guilty right now or uh, we'll try you and, and you may spend five years in prison, uh, after which then people were removed from the United States. So, you know, I think that uh, we will see a, a return to some of those tactics and there will be a lot of human misery that comes out of it. So how can a person get proper legal advice 
to become a legal American citizen. Yeah, I think that the biggest challenge is going to be uh, uh, finding ways to uh, use the limited uh, paths forward that the law provides. Since 1996, there's been really limited opportunities to get back to legal status if a person violates their status in any way. Um, certainly, people should come to our website, aila.org, aila.org. Uh, on that website, you can find reliable information about what the law is, uh, what's going on in, in immigration policies, and you can also get connected to resources in your community, whether you need individual representation or know someone who does, or whether you'd just like an immigration lawyer to come and speak with a community organization and educate you a bit more about this area. Could there be a border wall? Is that a real possibility? And what would the implications be? I think the border wall is uh, uh, symbolic at this point, and Congress needs to decide how many billion dollars it wants to spend on, on really a symbol of uh, whether America is closing itself off from the rest of the world. Uh, I don't think there's a great appetite for spending that kind of money on something which really uh, is not necessary as an enforcement mechanism. We've spent uh, more money on the border in the last years than, uh, you know, in the 20 years prior to, uh, uh, to that and, and we have a larger border patrol and the number of crossings is lower than it's ever been in the last 40 years. So uh, yeah, I think the wall is symbolic. It, it shows that uh, America is closing itself off, looking inward, that we're not uh, wanting to be the shining city on the hill, the welcoming place uh, that so many of us believe America should be. So I think we should talk with our uh, uh, elected representatives and indicate we don't want them to uh, fund that uh, uh, border wall. As an immigrant's daughter, my father raised six children and taught us work ethics, strong family values, and love for our country. How do immigrants enrich this country today? You know, immigrants enrich this country today uh, in the same way they have done for hundreds of years. Uh, we have always been a nation of immigrants. Every generation of immigrants uh, have, have assimilated to the United States, have become part of our fabric, part of our economy. Uh, you know, and that's just as true of, of your father and of my uh, great-grandfather who came here from Central Europe and, you know, worked in the coal mines in Pennsylvania and, and moved the family to Ohio, uh, where they've become successful business owners uh, two generations later. So. That is the immigration story in America. It's a story we need to keep reminding ourselves of. Uh, fear uh, is not the right reaction to immigrants. Uh, we need to continue to welcome them. Where can our viewers find more immigration information? At AILA.org, A-I-L-A dot O-R-G. Thank you, Bill, for your honest discussion on immigration and the need to ensure policy changes that respect our country's values and all Americans. Happy New Year to you. Thank you, Rose. Take care. Border security is not the only concern Americans have on their mind. According to IRS data, since 2010, 5.1 million people have been victims of tax identity theft fraud. Criminals use personal information to file fake tax returns and steal your refund. The good news is there's a new law in place called the PATH Act to help combat tax fraud. The not so good news is that it may delay millions of refunds this upcoming tax season. H&R Block's Kathy Pickering joins us this morning with more details. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. All right, Kathy, let's get right to it. Explain what the PATH Act means and how it will affect tax filers. So the PATH Act stands for Protecting Americans Against Tax Hikes. It was passed last year about this time, and in it are some provisions that are focused on combating tax identity theft. So what this means is that the IRS is now required to hold refunds for people who file the Earned Income Tax Credit or the Additional Child Tax Credit until at least February 15th. We know that there's about 30 million Americans who file for these credits, so that's gonna impact a lot of people. We really want to encourage people to file as they normally would, because the IRS does believe that it will be issuing most of the refunds within 21 days. I personally know individuals who are victims of tax fraud. Why is it becoming so common? And what safeguards can we use to fight tax identity theft and fraud? 
Well, tax identity theft has become really prevalent because there's been so many data breaches in the past, and with a social security number and date of birth, it has been easy up until recently to create a fake return and steal somebody's refund. So some of the things that we would really recommend that people do, first, file early because that way you've secured your refund, somebody else can't come in and steal that refund you know, out from underneath you. Second, it's important to manage your passwords. And what I mean by that is have a strong password, something that's complex, not easy to guess. Change it periodically and don't use the same password for all of your online accounts. And then finally, don't give out your social security number. We've heard so much about these scams where somebody says that they're from the IRS. And what I would say is if the IRS calls you, hang up. Because typically, if you're under an audit, if the IRS is needing to contact you, they're going to send you a letter first. So don't fall prey to those kinds of scams. How about when one receives a threatening phone call from an imposter IRS agent who tells you that you need to pay up right now what you owe the IRS and where to send the check? I experienced this myself when someone called looking for my son. And I took his cell number, I called Florida authorities, but before I hung up, I told him, don't bully me, I've got your telephone number and I'm reporting you to Florida authorities. And from what I understand, his name was already on the list. That's absolutely right. If, you're, if you have an attack like that, it's important to um, file a report, like you said, with the state of Florida, with the IRS, with the FTC, so that the word gets out and these people can be stopped. So how can we avoid being penalized if we don't have health insurance? The health insurance penalty is a troubling issue for many. So if you don't have health insurance, this, this year, the penalty will be $6.95 per uncovered adult and half that for children. For a family of four, it could be uh, a penalty of $2,000 if you're making only $60,000 a year. And we have a lot of information about this on our website at hrblock.com uh, forward slash path to get, uh, to get more information. Given that the penalties for not having insurance are as steep as they are, there are exemptions that are possible to get and they can actually be filed right on the tax return. If you find yourself in a situation where you need help with that, I would recommend seeing an H&R Block professional that can help you navigate through understanding what exemptions you might be eligible for. Thanks, Kathy, for joining us this morning with this important tax update and the information that's needed to combat tax fraud. Thanks, Rosalie. Appreciate it so much. For many, owning a home is a part of the American dream. But the new year and a new president brings a lot of uncertainty for both home buyers and sellers. Here to discuss new data on renting versus buying, securing a mortgage, what consumers perceive as the biggest obstacles to home ownership, and the result of a new Outlook survey is Trulia's chief economist, Ralph McLaughlin. Good morning, Ralph. Good morning, Rosalie. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you have a lot to share with us, so start with the results of the 2017 Outlook survey. Yeah, so what we found is that uh, Republicans are revived about their optimism for the housing market in 2017, and Democrats are somewhat discouraged. So what was unique about this year is that we ran our survey once before the election and once after the election. And what we saw is that before the election, uh, Republicans were actually very pessimistic about the housing market in 2017. After the election, they flip-flopped and became very optimistic. Uh, Democrats, on the other hand, were exactly the opposite. They were very optimistic about the election, uh, or I'm sorry, about the housing market before the election, and then became somewhat pessimistic. And we think a lot of this just had to do with the surprise victory of President-elect Trump. So we think in places where there are a large share of Republican households, we think this renewed optimism about the housing market may actually be reflected in greater home buying uh, activity in 2017. And 
conversely, areas with a higher share of Democrats might see a somewhat of a cool down in 2017. Uh, so that was the major finding from our survey, uh, you know, just, just last month. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so what were some more interesting findings of your survey? Yeah, you know, we found another uh, interesting data point, which is that for the first time in five years, home ownership is actually less a part of the American dream than it has been uh, in the past. Uh, last year, uh, it hit a uh, five-year high of 76% for all households, actually in 80% for, for millennials. Uh, millennials actually saw a big drop over last year, a drop from 80% down to 72% this year. Uh, so there are signs it's fading. Well, could it be that millennials aren't focused on saving and credit scores? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest challenges that millennials are telling us as to why they're not buying homes is because it is difficult to save for a down payment. Uh, you know, of all the factors that they tell us uh, need to change in order to buy a home, uh, one, saving up for a down payment, uh, two, uh, getting a job, and three, uh, improving their credit are the biggest factors that, that you know, they, they tell us that are keeping them from buying a home. Uh, you know, and part of that conversation uh, uh, you know, really is centered around rising rents. Rising rents make it more difficult to save up for a down payment. Uh, so you know, that's one of the challenges that we're seeing. However, uh, we are starting to see signs nationally that a tightening labor market is pushing up wages. You know, if, if, that way, if those wage increases make its way into millennials' pockets, then we might see them you know, better able to save up for a down payment and maybe buy a home, you know, over the next couple of years. What do you foresee? Any changes to the housing market once President Trump digs his heels into our economy? <laughs> well, you know, like I mentioned, uh, we are seeing uh, revived Republicans, uh, you know, across the country. And we think that is actually going to help uh, bridge uh, the gap between the bargain belt, which are metros in the Midwest and the South, uh, and it will help those metros catch up with the costly coast. The costly coast have seen lots of price increases over the last few years. Miami is kind of in this weird uh, situation where they kind of act like a, a costly coast market in some respects, but then they also act like a bargain market in, in, in others. But, you know, if you look at the 10 markets that we're keeping a close eye on in 20. 2017. Five of those are in Florida. Miami is, uh, you know, not one of them, but Miami, you know, does come up towards the top of our list. But places like uh, uh, Jacksonville um, and uh, Deltona, Daytona Beach, uh, you know, do make the top of our list. And that's because in general, Florida has seen very good job growth and it's seen job growth in, you know, pretty decently paying jobs, uh, you know, in, in the construction industry, in the professional and business service industry. And then we've also seen strong job growth in leisure and hospitality. And we think a lot of that is because, uh, you know, A, baby boomers are aging and starting to retire in the Sunshine State. And, and B, uh, that, you know, Florida has, has a great tourism economy. And, and as, the, as the economy uh, in the U.S. recovers, people want a vacation in Florida. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're keeping an eye on Florida uh, and, and also some other metros in the South. Any housing market trends you're forecasting in 2017? Yeah, you know, I think the elephant in the room is mortgage rates, right? You know, after Trump was elected, mortgage rates shot up from, you know, about 3.4% uh, to around 4%. And I think, you know, a lot of people started to get nervous about, you know, what's what's going to happen? Should should I buy a home? Uh, you know, for the most part, home buyers don't really have to worry about rising mortgage rates because uh, in many places, in particular uh, Miami and the rest of the South, mortgage rates would have to be 7, 8, 9, even 10 percent in some markets for the cost of buying to be the same as the cost of renting. So, uh, you know, don't really have to worry about that in those markets. Um, you know, home buyers don't worry about mortgage rates. Tell us what you believe consumers can look forward to. Uh, you know, look forward to maybe inventory, uh, you know, starting to ease up, uh, but still affordability pressures are, are there. What concerns should consumers be aware of? You know, consumers be aware of, um, uh, uh, you know, rising uh, prices in many markets. Uh, prices are, uh, you know, starting to get to the point where uh, uh, it, homes are unaffordable. You know, Miami is an example where it will take about a third of their income, which, you know, the federal government does, does consider uh, unaffordable. All right, Ralph, where can our viewers find more information? 
www.trulia.com. Thanks, Ralph, for joining us this morning to discuss the housing outlook and new trends and consumer hopes, dreams, and fears in the new year. Happy New Year to you. Thanks, Rosalie. If you're looking to expand your professional circle this year, listen up. In 2001, women in e-commerce began an online professional network to provide women in business who had a web presence, educational, motivational, and networking events. Women in e-commerce signature event is the Golden Mouse Award. It recognizes women who successfully use web technology in business and who are leaders in their industry and profession. Heidi Richards Mooney is founder and CEO of Women in E-Commerce. She has close to three decades of experience as an owner of successful small businesses on and offline. In 2005, Heidi was named one of the top 50 virtual women who shaped the internet by the International Virtual Women's Chamber of Commerce. Women in business from Broward, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach counties were honored for their leadership in their industry. And I was humbled and grateful to be selected as an honoree, as a TV host, journalist, who expands her public affairs programming to the internet so that viewers via our website and other social media sites can watch The Rose Lee Show. It was a true honor to receive this award, and our team at Rosalie Production enjoyed the Golden Mouse Awards. Winning this award was possible because Rosalie Productions has a great team working together behind the scenes. The 2016 Lifetime Legacy Golden Mouse honoree was Dr. Tina Dupree. Dr. Tina Dupree is known as the Chicken Lady because of her interesting beginnings as a speaker and trainer in the industry. If you're good at whatever you do, you don't have to worry about the competition. Yes. All you have to do is be good. I want everybody to repeat after me and say, be good, be good. get good, yes. or get gone. Yes. Congratulations to all the Golden Mouse Award recipients. And ladies, know that if you're out there with a small business, you too can find direction and support. Learn more about women in e-commerce at WECAI.org. The new year offers an opportunity to wipe the slate clean and reevaluate our personal and professional life by making calculated choices from career options to real estate life moves forward each year. So share with us your life's possibilities in the new year at facebook.com forward slash Rose Lee Show or follow us on Instagram at The Rose Lee Show and watch this episode and many others here at Ion Television or 24-7 at rosaleearchershow.com. Thanks for joining us this morning and have a happy and healthy new year for you and your entire family.